Welcome to today's presentation. This is Gabriella Dara, and on behalf of HBKS Wealth Advisors, thank you for participating in our discussion on the fundamentals of financial planning. Today's presentation is a great introduction or refresher for all investors, but especially those who are in early stages of building a financial plan or may be considering changes to an existing plan as a result of a recent life event, such as a job change, marriage, or addition of a new family member. Our discussion will focus on three primary topics. First, personal financial management. Second, retirement planning and life insurance. And third, life insurance and protection planning. These topics are the building blocks of a comprehensive, comprehensive financial strategy. Our presenters today include several of our HBKS principals and senior financial advisors, Brittany Taylor, Matt Costigan, and David Darwish. They will be addressing many of the common questions and needs they've encountered while working with clients to develop tailored financial plans to meet individual goals. At this time, I will turn over the presentation to Brittany, who will start us off with personal financial management. Thank you, Gabriella. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Many of our clients uh, we work with are well-established in their financial life. We found that the ones that are the most successful prioritize their financial health and practice many of the areas I'm gonna go over with you today. As we all like to be more mindful in our lives in general, it's also important to be, be financially mindful. Some ways that we can do that, I'm gonna talk about are creating and monitoring your budget, along with building credit and managing debt. Uh, regarding creating a budget, whether you're starting out single as a new family or well into your financial life, it's always important to create and manage a budget. Some tools that they have for budgeting now are things like spreadsheets, software programs, or budgeting apps. Some free budgeting apps um, that we have seen are things like Mint, Pocket Guard, or You Need a Budget. Those are really helpful because you're downloading transactions on a daily basis from various accounts that you might have, and so you can actually really monitor on a day-to-day uh, how much you're spending so that it's easier for you to monitor going forward. And then for those of you that are, tech, that are technology savvy, um, there's some services such as Tiller, Tiller which uses Google Sheets uh, and also Quicken. Another mistake that people make, uh, or one of the biggest mistakes people make, is not making their budget realistic. You may need to get several months of data to determine how much you spend on non-fixed expenses such as groceries, utilities, and clothes. Don't set a budget that's impossible. Like dieting or exercising, if you set the bar too high, you will set yourself up for failure and then lose motivation to do any of it. For couples, make sure you're both involved in determining the budget. Each of you may have different spending habits and may have different items you're responsible for buying for the household. For instance, I buy the kids clothes for our family, so my husband would not have a lot of insight on how much we should spend or budget. Make sure you're monitoring your budget. A budget that isn't monitored is completely ineffective. You need to review and check your progress on a regular basis to see what may need to be adjusted or what expenses you need to be more diligent about reducing. There are different types of expenses. Uh, basically, I split it into to do two different types. So you have essential expenses such as housing, groceries, utilities, um, and liability tip payments. These expenses can also be managed and trying to keep them at a certain level or percentage of your income. So try not to stretch yourself on expenses like your mortgage and car payments. Make sure you are living within your means. Some non-essential expenses would be things like dining out, traveling, entertainment. Ultimately, we can't predict the future, so we can't save every penny or we will miss out on life. However, it is about finding a balance and determine what non-essential items are important to you and your family to splurge on and then include them in the budget. The big thing is to actually cut expenses. So going through the exercise of setting a budget is generally eye-opening on some non-essential items we spend money on. Watch your impulse buys, especially walking out the stores, as they can add up. Some other helpful tips are packing your lunch, avoiding coffee runs, and making a menu each week to make your grocery list. So if, we're, if we've planned well enough and you have uh, what we call discretionary income each month, which is the income left over after expenses, that can allow you to focus on setting some short-term and long-term financial goals. 
It's important to set both types of goals. Short-term goals may be focused on paying off smaller debt, such as credit card debt, planning for a furniture purchase or home renovation, or even setting a target of where you want your savings to be at the end of the year. Long-term goals would be things like having a certain amount of money in retirement assets at a certain age, retirement goals, helping kids with their college, or purchasing a home. One of the important things uh, that you should make part of your initial priorities is an emergency savings. The general rule is at least three to six months worth of expenses. If you're single or the primary earner in a family, you may want to err on the side of caution and, and have about six months worth. This is to help protect in events of someone losing their job, having an unforeseen costly emergency, or as we have seen in recent months, a potential pandemic. Automating your savings plan uh, is an important thing along with just getting started. So automating your savings plan can be very helpful in reaching your financial goals. You can do this with adding to savings and investment accounts. If you're thinking we'll just wait to see how much cash is left over at the end of the month, you're not likely to have anything left over to save. And a big thing is just getting started uh, and getting started early. So the cost of waiting until you have larger sums is expensive as you're giving up compounded returns. If you only have $50 or $100 per month to get started, that is fine. And then just try to increase each year as you pay off debt, redirect those dollars to savings and investing. A lot of my clients ask me how their children can build credit. Here are some ways to, to get started on building your credit. So some areas that people don't realize are even just utility payments, so such things like rent, phone, and utilities um, can help build your credit. So for instance, when I went to college, the cable bill went in my name, and so that allowed me to start building a credit history. In regard to debt payments, as a first step, there are, are credit builder loans, secured loans, and co-side loans. So credit builder loans can be seen as a forced way of saving as a financial institution will not release the balance until you have paid the, the amount in full. Secure loans are backed by cash, so you've already saved those dollars. And these are just ways to build your credit um, until you can get an un, un, unsecured credit card. So for credit cards, um, to make sense, uh, there's a, a secured credit card which is backed by a cash deposit. The credit limit is the same as the cash deposit amount you make you'll receive the deposit back when you close the account. You could also be added as a co-signed credit card uh, authorization or be added, I'm sorry, or be added as an authorized user on another person's card, both allowing you to build credit until you can get approved for your own unsecured credit card. Some good habits to build your score would be make 100% of your payments on time. Uh, also keep your credit utilization low. Avoid applying for multiple cards or loans too close together, and then create and then keep credit card accounts open. Um, as what most people don't realize is closing accounts can hurt your credit utilization along with reducing your average account age. So to, talking about debt, uh, there are good debt versus bad debt. Um, so good debt is defined as low interest debt that helps you increase your income or net worth. Uh, these are things like mortgage, student loans, and credit cards. Just keep in mind that too much of any kind of debt can turn from a good debt to a bad debt. Bad debt is defined as expensive debts that drag down your financial situation. These are things like high interest credit cards, personal loans, used for discretionary purchase, and payday loans. So a lot of people starting out tend to have some credit card debt, and so uh, I wanna just touch on ways to address or try to uh, get out of credit card debt. So one of the key things is to, to try and lower your interest rate. So either call the credit card companies um, or look into lower interest rate credit cards or even 0% credit cards. For the 0% credit cards, make sure you're paying attention to the transfer fees along with making sure you pay attention um, to the time period to make sure you could pay it off and you set a plan to pay it off before that time period is up or you get charged the, the interest. Make a list of your debt, so put together an inventory of your debts li and liabilities, including payoff amounts, interest rates, monthly payments, and payoff dates. Then choose a method and prioritize your debt. People have different ways of approaching this, so there's the most annoying debt, smallest balances to, to just get those uh, off, off of your books, um, and then 
the one we see most likely is the highest interest rate. So start with the highest interest rate so that you're making progress. And then once you've paid off, on, paid off those debts, make sure that you're redirecting those payments to the next credit card to get that paid off. So these are just some basic strategies and ideas that can help you put, uh, can help put you on the right path for a healthy financial life. Setting good financial habits early on can save you from making more significant sacrifices if you have to catch up later. I hope these ideas will help set the tone for your financial success. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to discuss retirement planning. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks very much. Uh, the to topic of retirement planning is it, it's, it's an absolute passion of mine. I really, really love uh, talking about um, you know just the the process of planning for retirement um, for younger clients clients that are older, maybe closer to their retirement date. Um, but for the purposes of, 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 this, of this webinar, we're really going to start and, and talk about retirement planning for, for younger clients, uh, why it's important uh, to, to start early. Um, it's, it's, again, something I really love to talk about uh, with younger clients. I love, love, love showing up to college graduation parties and uh, you know, almost ruining the new grad's time and uh, you know, asking what their you know the 401k plan is going to look like for their very first job out of school, you know, or if they're going to be self-employed, you know, what the, what what they're going to do to budget to save money for retirement, and I, and I think similar to you know bu budgeting, as Brittany was just talking about, this is something that is absolutely within someone's control. Um, certainly, equity markets and different types of security markets are almost out of our control. Um, but, you know, if using proper techniques and really maintaining discipline, um, you can have very, very great results. Um, I'm 39. I could not have been happier that I have started saving for retirement 17 years ago when I finished school and, uh, and, and started my first uh, professional job that thankfully had a 401k plan. That, that, that was part of it. Um, Albert Einstein has a wonderful quote, and I and I remember hearing this quote um, at some point when I was when I was in school. Although I'll say it's definitely not taught in schools, and that is compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Um, so when you really start to understand the benefits of saving early, and that compound interest is absolutely your friend, you will understand why it is the eighth wonder of the world. And so I, I, I want to go through and I want to demonstrate, and I really want to demonstrate this. I, I, I really want to show why it's important to start early, right? And it's a, and it's, and it's a, and it's really a math formula that can be, you know, done with, you know, any amount of money. So I tried to pick, you know, something that I think would be, uh, you know, easy to understand. Um, the difference of saving $10,000 a year and this calculation is, you know, not saving a lump sum of ten thousand dollars a year. It's taking that amount of ten thousand divided by twelve, which is about eight hundred and thirty-three dollars a month. Um, you know, which which might sound a little bit daunting for someone that that is younger, but you know, st stick with me here. Um, if you do that for forty years and earn a six percent annualized steady rate of return, of course, that's not exactly what's going to happen, but we have to pick a number and stick with it. You're going to end up with 1.6, almost 1.7 million dollars over that 40-year period. If you wait another 10 years until you're the age of 35, and by the way, that's very traditional thinking of what people think. They think if they're in their early 20s, they're trying to budget things out, they don't have the money for retirement. They think, listen, if I can't save X amount of dollars, then really, what's the point? Well, there is an enormous point. In, in, in waiting. So if you wait in the same calculation, $10,000 a year until the age of 65, now granted, you're only saving for 30 years versus 40. Look at the calculation that, that here, you have $841,000, certainly a great sum of money, but it's almost about 50% of what that is. And really what it took was just another 10 years of savings. And what this what this calculation doesn't show doesn't show um, if you have the ability to increase your savings rate over time as you develop in your career and have the ability 
you know, to save, to, to, to save more. And that is a, that's a, that's a fantastic method is start somewhere, start, do what you can do. And if you get future increases, really, really dedicate those increases to not increasing your lifestyle, but to increase the amount that you are saving to retirement. Um, there's no rule of thumb about what to save either. Um, you know, there's certainly IRS guidelines for what you can save within um, tax qualified plans. Um, and I and I want to and I want to illustrate what those plans look like. You know, you have the ability. You know, if you are through an employer, you have the ability to operate in a 401k. Um, everyone has the ability to operate. Um, within an with within an IRA, and if you are self-employed, you work for yourself, not through an employer. You have the ability to have tax qualified plans as well. Um, so this chart that we're looking at right now really changes each and every year. It is different this year than it was last year. It's going to look different next year. Um, so an overriding point I want to make is it's very important to work with a professional so that you know what the guidelines are and what the rules are. Um, it's, it's very hard to go this route uh, alone. Certainly there's always do it yourself options, but you know, you can make a, you know, a very crucial mistake, cost yourself a lot of, you know, time, money, and, and headache when looking through what all the options are to save for, for retirement. Um, if you are employed, 401k is a fantastic, if you're employed and it has an employer that, that has a 401k plan, that is a fantastic way to save retirement. Um, it, it, it really is. The money comes directly out of your paycheck, goes directly into your 401k account, into the allocation that you have picked. Um, it's a very set it and forget it type of, type, type of plan in that you don't have to think about writing a check every single time you want to make a contribution. Um, Dollar cost averaging is absolutely your friend. And what that means is having, you know, an amount of money that goes in every two weeks, every, you know, every, you know, by, by monthly, however you get paid, you don't have to think about it very frequently. That money is going in. Um, we're going through this COVID-19 panic and we had um, stocks and different types of securities drop very, very quickly. Um, People that are in 401k plans that didn't make any adjustments um, from where we stand today, they are very, very thankful that they participated in dollar cost averaging because they were able to buy at very low points and really didn't have to think about it too, too much. Um, it's, it's, it's been a, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a, a blessing for folks that have had access to these plans over their, over their working career. Um, Individual retirement accounts, IRA accounts, those are available to anyone that has earned income. And there are different types. You can do a pre-tax account. There is a post-tax account known as a Roth IRA account where rather than a, a, a regular retirement account where you put money in, you get a nice tax deduction for it. Roth accounts, you do not get a tax deduction going in, but the money goes in after tax, grows tax-free. And when you take the money out in a qualified fashion, post age 59 and a half, you have the ability to not pay any income tax on the way out. Um, there's restrictions, there's income restrictions as far as who can and cannot participate in a, in a Roth IRA. Everyone can participate in an IRA. Um, it just depends upon how much money you make, whether or not that contribution you're making is tax deductible. It's very easy to get lost in the weeds as far as details um, about how all of these plans can work. But if you work for yourself, the last column there on the right, you have a great opportunity to save a, a, a very large amount of money in a, uh, in a retirement plan. And what all of these plans have in common is that they're all tax deferred, meaning the money goes in and it grows tax free. That is such a great benefit as you develop in your working career, hopefully progress, have a higher level of income, which means you're probably going to be subject to income, greater income taxes along the way. And these plans, until you reach your, your, your retirement age, and you can see the common theme at the very bottom is once you reach that magical age of 59 and a half, 
you're, you're able to take money out of the plans without penalty. But if you're self-employed, you have the ability to save money within a, a SEP IRA, a solo 401k, uh, possibly a simple IRA. Um, these are all tools that you can use if you are self-employed. And, and really, that's you know, where we give a lot of guidance to people that are self-employed, um, maybe run small businesses themselves there's a great opportunity to save a decent amount of money. You can see, you know, it's, it varies as far as what you can put in, but it could be as much, you know, as much as $57,000. Um, so there's all types of plans to suit and, you know, become sort of a more tailored uh, uh, process for an individual if they are used the, the, the right way. Um, but I think as my, uh, as my, as my colleague, uh, David Darwish would uh, would would say you know your your planning will certainly be derailed if you do not have the proper protection in place. So I'm going to turn this over to him. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate that. And and I was going to start with that. Now that we have some of the the basics of financial planning down, we need to make sure that we can protect everything we work so hard for. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about when you should look to purchase insurance and some of the solutions available. We're going to just hit some of the, some of the basic term uh, insurance, permanent policy insurance today, but let's, let's just talk about some of the life event triggers that would cause you to uh, reevaluate where you stand with insurance and the financial plan for that purpose. Um, a new job is a big one. Anytime you go through a job change, that's, that's a good time to reevaluate what type of insurance cover coverage you have. Uh, typically, employers will provide you with some form of life insurance coverage, typically one to two times your salary. Um, some employers offer more. You'd have to go through some medical underwriting for that. But most of the time, it, it may not be enough for you to, um, to plan for. You may need more insurance. Um, it's always a good time to evaluate when, you're, when you have a new job. Another time to really take a step back is if you're you're entering into a marriage if something happened to you or your spouse and you wanted to replace some of that lost income definitely reevaluate reevaluate the insurance at that time a new home is another big one um, many times you'll find that individuals will want to protect if one of the uh, one of you pass away and you have this mortgage sitting there maybe you're the maybe the breadwinner passes away and you and you're not sure how you're going to fund that mortgage. Well, if you bought a 30-year mortgage, maybe the idea is to take out a 30-year term policy, and 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 have that there in place in case uh, one of you passes away. You can quickly pay off the pay off the mortgage and not have that um, burden. And then finally, a baby. And and I tell all of my, especially the first time expecting parents, I say, listen, this baby's on its way. There's <laughs> no turning back. Don't wait until the baby comes. The baby's going to come. So you need to start planning now and make sure that you have the right coverages in place uh, to protect the, the entire family. It's not just the two of you anymore. You want to protect for the entire family. We're going to, we're going to touch on just a, some basic types of insurance. We can get much more deeper in this and we will in future webinars, but we're just going to talk about the two basic types of life insurance. There's, there's term life insurance, which is for a specific term, specific period of time. Uh, typically, I'd say the most common terms are in the 20 to 30 year range, um, but I've also seen it for other, for other reasons, maybe a 10 year term. Keep in mind, the, the older you are, the more expensive the insurance gets. So, if you plan early and you, you, you have longevity, then you can buy some term insurance, relatively inexpensive. Um, versus a permanent policy, this is going to last for your entire life. A permanent policy will go beyond that 30-year term uh, to carry you into, into your elder years. And a lot of times, we'll, we'll buy this type of coverage for maybe some estate liquidity, um, or to, to fund other types of uh, needs, maybe just uh, creating a legacy for the next generation, but a permanent policy will be there for your entire life. Um, with a term policy, there's no cash accumulation. It's just basically you're buying very inexpensive insurance. It's not going to build up any cash. If you never need it, hopefully, then 
you know what? It served its purpose. You had the insurance in place, but you thankfully you never needed it. Um, you're not going to get any cash value buildup. But with a permanent policy, you can buy um, a policy that's going to build up some cash value. And I kind of look at that as almost like another asset class. You have you have stocks, you have bonds. You can buy insurance almost as another asset class and build up some cash in there. Um, of course, insurance is going to cover premature death, which is which is um, given. Uh, med- medical exam, you know, getting term insurance is very easy. The insurers, especially after COVID, are getting more and more creative in, in, in making this process as easy as possible. Um, when you do go through and have to buy insurance, you have to go through medical underwriting and you have to give uh, your medical history and they're going to check the medical information bureau, bureau to make sure that all of your um, medical records are in line with what you put on the application. But there are um, ways to accelerate that. And there's also ways, if, you, if you're clean and you're in your 20s or 30s and there's not a lot of uh, medical issues, they may just uh, not require a medical exam and make the process even easier. But with permanent insurance, it's a little more involved. Typically, you're going you're gonna to have to go through the medical exam. And it, that really just consists of uh, drawing some blood and some other specimens and blood pressure, things like that. Let's talk about conversion features because this is something that many who buy term policies don't are not aware of. Um, if you own a term policy, let's say you took out a 20-year term and the years are going by and you develop some type of illness that's going to be with you. It's, maybe it's not terminal, but it's going to be an illness that's going to be on your record. Um, you have the option to convert that policy to a permanent policy. Some carriers, some insurance carriers are, are, have more robust offerings than others, but the conversion features are nice because if you're not insurable and you have this term policy and you're um, needing to extend that, a conversion is, is something you definitely want to take a look at. Um, and then with, there are policies, they offer all different types of riders. You'll find, and this will be in subsequent webinars as well, but long-term care riders can be um, purchased on life insurance policies. And, and the industry has gotten very creative because long-term care costs have gone up quite a bit. There's ways to purchase um, coverage or a rider where you can actually get a benefit if you need long-term care. You can take a benefit which would reduce your the death benefit to your heirs in the future, but you can utilize that policy now. You don't have to wait to, to die to utilize the policy. You can utilize the policy in your in your retirement years, uh, and if you're needing long term care. Um, the rule of thumb. I mean, we really have to do a life insurance needs analysis to know how much you need to buy with a mortgage. It's easy. It's you know, you take out a two hundred fifty thousand dollar mortgage. Maybe you want to protect that and take out a two hundred fifty thousand dollar policy, but Typical rule of thumb is you should have about five to 10 times your annual salary in some type of life insurance benefit. It's not a hard and set rule, but the financial planning process will help us determine what's that, what's that optimal number. number. And then the premium cost vary, will, be, will vary based on the age and your health condition. The younger you are, the healthier you are, the less expensive the policy is going to be. We're going to transition over from term insurance to disability insurance now. Uh, This insurance covers a disability as a result of an injury or illness where you can't perform your normal work duties. Uh, You can purchase it individually through an insurance company, or you can purchase it uh, offer. You know, you can purchase it through an employer, and and typically employers offer this. Long-term uh, disability, short-term disability, it's less expensive than what you can find in the open market. And you don't have to go through the underwriting process, and it's an easy uh, form that you fill out with human resources. I encourage all of you, if you, don't, do not, if you did not take out the short or long-term disability with your employer, if, you, if it's available, when that enrollment opens up, take a serious look at it. I'm happy to, to look at the options with you. Um, but it's very critical that you have this type of insurance in place because if you did have some type of illness or injury, um, this can throw off everything we discussed before is putting a good retirement plan together. If you don't have the income coming in, we can't take care of all the pieces that, that need to be taken care of. Um, 
a couple different types. There's basically short-term, long-term disability. Short-term is going to typically cover you between that three to six month time period. The long-term disability kicks in after your short-term disability policy runs out, and typically they're written to last until you're age 65. If it was a long, long-term disability, they'll typically go to age 65. I have some clients who are still in their working years. They choose to work, and um, you know, if, if they become disabled after that, the policies typically um, will insure you for one or two years if you're over that age 65 time period. But again, that's where the financial planning process comes in. Do we still need the insurance? Did we save up enough money to fund all of our goals if we did become disabled? So all of those things are really important. Um, there are some other types of disability insurance available. Um, you could buy, if you become disabled, you could have a co uh, policy that will pay and continue your 401k contributions going in for you. If you're unable to work, you still want to save. So there's policies for that. There's policies to pay your, your mortgage disability. Uh, within businesses, there's key person disability insurance. So there's all different types. As you can tell, we're just scratching the surface here, but there's all types of op options that are out there. Um, these types of policies typically pay out about 50 to 60% of your current income or your base income. Now you say, well, 50 to 60% is not really getting the job done. We're not going to be able to meet all of our, all of our uh, goals with that. Well, that's when we need to have the discussion about who's paying for this insurance. Is your employer paying for this insurance or are you paying for this insurance? Very really important. Um, if, if you pay for the insurance and need, to draw on that disability policy, your benefits are tax-free. So maybe 50 to 60% is enough to cover because you're not having to, to uh, pay tax on that income. If the employer pays it, you're going to pay tax on that 50 to 60% of income that's coming in. And that's, that definitely can make a big difference there. So just wanted to point that out. Um, I'm available for questions if anyone wants to follow up with me, but I've enjoyed presenting to you all today. Thank you. Thank you, David, Matt, and Brittany for sharing your insights and very practical recommendations. Um, I think there's a lot of great tips here that um, would appeal to many different types of investors. Um, if you are looking for additional information, we really encourage you to visit our website, hbkswealth.com. You'll find details about our services and can access articles authored by our financial professionals on a, a very wide range of timely topics from financial planning, retirement, estate planning, um, and as well as commentary um, and insights on the current market conditions. So uh, there's just a wealth of information there. And you can also go ahead and contact an advisor directly through our website. Um, and if you don't have an advisor, um, certainly we encourage you to um, contact us and submit an, a request using uh, the form on our contact us page. So please take advantage of those resources. They're there um, and uh, have a, a lot of great information for you to, to take in. Well, this concludes our presentation and we certainly appreciate you attending um, and hope that you will join us for future webinars. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to you know, Brittany, Matt, or David. Um, they'll be happy to assist you. And if you have um, any additional questions, um, you know, certainly reach out. Uh, we, we are here to help, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you again for attending, and uh, stay well.